All right, well, good morning. Come on, who's excited to be in the house of the Lord this morning? You make a little bit of noise, yeah. Man, it is so good to see you guys. It is cold outside, which means Christmas is in the air. How many of you are excited about Christmas this year? Come on, you're excited about Christmas? Man, I am so, so excited about Christmas. In fact, I told my wife, I said, I wish today was Christmas Day because I just want to see my kids' face when they open up some of their gifts and stuff. So I'm super excited about Christmas this week. And speaking of Christmas, we may get a white Christmas. Come on. Did you see that? I don't know if the weatherman's ever been really accurate or not around here in the eastern part of Kentucky, but however, they're expecting our Christmas services. We moved Christmas services from Sunday morning to Friday night, this coming Friday night. That's right, we have two services at our campuses and we're expecting train rides and snow and blizzard and hot cocoa. How, I mean, how much better is that, right? I mean, I am so excited. I'm so glad it's gonna snow. People's like, I'm scared of the snow. Well, you didn't live in the 80s, man, because they like, when it snowed, like they didn't shovel the road like you were stuck like for four days, which was awesome. Make sure you had plenty of bread and milk. Like it was so, so good. Like I'm the guy who loves when it snows. I love getting out when it snows. I love driving in the snow. Me and my friends like doing donuts in the snow. You know what I'm saying? Like that, I'm that guy. And so I'm not afraid of the snow, but man, we cannot wait. Even we have snow, unless something dramatically happen, like, you know, winter blizzard or something just takes over. We're gonna have our Christmas services. We're moving them from Sunday to Friday, which is gonna be fun. And also, New Year's is coming up, and just wanna make sure you're aware, on Sunday morning, on January the 1st, we're moving our services from Sunday morning to Sunday night. We're gonna have one service praying and worshiping in the new year, and so on January 1, have fun, but that night, we're gonna worship and pray. It's gonna be so much fun, you don't want to miss it. Now, I wanna say thank you to every one of us, to every one of you guys as well who actually participated in the year in offering. I'm telling you what, the families, the kids, uh, the, the missionaries, the organizations that you and us as a church are able to bless, just thank you so much. And if you came prepared today to do that and you kind of forgot or whatever, you can always do it online. That's how my wife and I give. So really excited about to see what the Lord's gonna do through that year in offering. Now, the cast of Christmas. I'm telling you what, this has been a fun series, man. I really enjoy studying for it. I really Really, uh, uh, I've, I've just really learned a lot about it too as well. But the nativity scene that we see today, and you got baby Jesus in the manger and Mary and Joseph, they all have a backstory. You got the wise men, you got the shepherds, and, and, and all the people in the story leading up to the birth of Jesus, during the birth of Jesus, all have a role to play in the cast of Christmas. And we start about being behind the scenes a little bit. Like what is taking place behind the scenes and, and when did Christmas actually started in the, in the scriptures, which we know goes all the way back to Genesis chapter three. And then last week, come on, we looked at Mary and Joseph. You can't have it, right? The manger and, 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 maybe, and, and Mary and Joseph. You can't have the nativity scene without Mary and Joseph. Now, I don't know if you really thought about the backstory of them. We talked a little bit about this last week. Is that Joseph's dad went and pursued Mary's family and said, I like to arrange a marriage between my son and your daughter. And Mary's dad agreed. And so they signed a contract that legally made them married to each other. And then Joseph's dad actually provided a payment for her to the family. And for one year, we, they call it the betrothed stage or the engagement, and there's many reasons for that, but one of the main reasons is to make sure that she wasn't pregnant for while they were getting married. And so they would live separate places. They wouldn't live with each other. They had no sexual relation with each other, and Joseph would stay home, prepare a place on his father's house for him and his new bride. She was getting ready for the day when her husband came back and got her, and then Gabriel shows up. And Gabriel says, Mary, I know you're ready to get married. And Mary, I know you have a legally binding contract. But what God is about to put inside of you is the Son of God that's gonna change the world and you're to name him Jesus. Well, guess what? Joseph finds out about this. And Joseph says, I'm gonna divorce her secretly. The only way to break the marriage was a certificate of divorce because they were legally married. But then the Bible tells us that Joseph fell asleep and the angel of the Lord appeared to him in the sleep and said, what Mary tells you is true. She's gonna give birth to the Son of God and you are to name him Jesus. And immediately when he woke up, he took his wife. He didn't wait for the 12 months to pass. He took his wife, Mary, to be his wife to protect her. But also, we wanna make it very important, not to have any sexual relations with her all the way to baby Jesus was born. And it's with that that we pick up and Luke chapter two. Now, this is, the, this is kind of the Christmas story, right? This is the cast of Christmas of the, of the story. So in Luke chapter two, we're gonna look for, through just a few verses here and then we're gonna have a good time eating some Mexican. Can I get an amen? Come on. Okay, you don't like Mexican. It's okay, I'll do. All right, so Luke chapter two, verse one. 
Now in the days a decree went out from Caesar Augustus that a census would be taken of all the inhabitant of earth or all the Roman Empire. Now let's stop there. Who is this Caesar Augustus? And how is he playing a behind the scenes role in this cast of Christmas? Well, let me ask you, how many of you have heard of Julius Caesar? Come on, all of our campuses, get your hands up, all of our campuses, Julius Caesar. Good, how many of you played Julius Caesar like in a Christmas, like in a play at school or something, right? You've heard of Julius Caesar. Like most of us heard of Julius Caesar. But Julius Caesar rose to power in around 45 BC and two of his closest friends thought that he was gonna become too powerful and be the most powerful person in the world. And two of his closest friends killed him. It's crazy, crazy, crazy story. But before he died, there's some great things that he did. He's the one that came up with the 365 day calendar that we still use today. He's the one who says, you know what? Let's take the quarter days that we miss every four year and let's have leap year. He came up with leap year for 366 days. And I don't know if you know this or not, but July is named after Julius Caesar for the month, because he had a Julian calendar. So very fascinating how he thought. But he had a nephew, and when his nephew turned 18, he adopted him as his son. And his nephew is Caesar Augustus. So in 44 BC, when Julius Caesar was murdered, Caesar Augustus now took over the power of Rome to lead Rome. And boy, did he ever lead Rome. In fact, Julius Caesar was known as, you may have heard this before, you've seen the movies, I came, I saw, and I conquered. That was the famous statement of Julius Caesar. And so now here's Caesar Augustus, his adopted nephew that becomes his son, is now leading the Roman Empire. Now, Caesar Augustus is not his name. Caesar just means emperor. Augustus means reverend or or honored or esteemed. So he is the most reverend, esteemed, honorable emperor of Rome. His real name is Gaius Octavius. And so Gaius Octavius takes over the Roman Empire, and when he did, he did some fascinating things. In fact, he brought peace among peace, Rome prosper. He built roads all over the place, so all roads would lead to Rome, and one reason we call it the Roman road, right? Like when we share the gospel, like all passages lead to Rome. He prospered the, the empire, he grew the empire, and because the empire was continuing to expand and expand and expand, Caesar Augustus says, guys, I don't know if everybody's paying taxes or not. So let's create a census and let's put a census down and let's count people in all the Roman Empire and let's make sure they are paying taxes. So Augustus puts out a, a, a word everywhere that a census must be taken. And so the Romans take into Nazareth and they go in and they, they make an announcement or they would nail an announcement onto a wood post somewhere and you walk by and go, why is the Roman soldiers here? And you will look and it says, is you have been required to register for the census, aka we wanna make sure you're paying taxes. So every single person had to, watch this, you had to go back to your hometown or where your genealogy starts or where your bloodline is Therefore, to register for the census. Well, Joseph is from the house of David. That's very important. We're gonna look at that just in a moment. He's from the bloodline of David, which means he has to go back to the city of David, which we know as Bethlehem. And so here's what happens in verse three. And all the people were on their way to register for the census, each to his own city. You had to go to the city, wherever your family tree was. Now Joseph also went up from Galilee, from the city of Nazareth to Judea, to the city of David, which is called Bethlehem, because he was from the house or the family of David. He was from the direct bloodline of David. Like his great, 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 28 great grandpa was like David, which is called Bethlehem. In verse five, in order to register along with Mary, who was betrothed to him and was pregnant at that time. And so here is Joseph, puts Mary on a mule, a donkey, a camel, whatever, and now we're gonna go four to five days, 80 to 70 to 80 miles away, four to five days in your third trimester, ladies, come on now, you're pregnant because we have to go register for taxes. He had to register his name and also here for Mary. But what's so fascinating about this, what's so unique about this is what the prophet Micah says. And Micah in chapter five, verse two says, but as for you, Bethlehem, 
See, they thought Bethlehem, there was nothing fascinating about Bethlehem, you know, just to see. But for as for you, Bethlehem, you think you're too little among the clans of Judah? <laughs> Let me tell you what God says. From you, one, see the capital one, that's Jesus. From you, one will come forth for me to be the ruler of Israel and times of his comings forth are from long ago, which means I have planned this in eternity. From the days of eternity, I knew that my son would be born in Bethlehem. And isn't it amazing that God uses the census to fulfill scripture? Let's just go back. That God put in the most powerful man on the planet an idea to count people to make sure they pay taxes just to get Joseph and Mary to travel to Bethlehem. Is that not fascinating? So let me just go on and say this. When we see what's going on in our world and we see kings and we see presidents and we see rulers do all these things, let me tell you something. You don't have to worry one bit about it because God is in control. So we don't have to panic. If God wants to raise up a pagan king and use him for something and bring about something, he will do it. And he put in the mind of the most powerful person on the planet, count of senses. Why? Because I've got this little boy and this little girl, these teenagers that need to go to Bethlehem because my prophet, my mouthpiece, said it in Micah that he is to be born in Bethlehem. God can use whatever he wants to use to carry out his purpose and his will. Verse six. While they were there, the time came for her to give birth. See, that's very important. Let me read that real slowly one more time. While they were there, while they were in Bethlehem, the time came for her to give birth, we know, to Jesus. And she gave birth to her, don't miss this, firstborn son, and she wrapped him in the clothes and laid him in a manger because there was no room for them in the end. Now, this is where our nativity scenes take a turn. This is where the westernized world and our mindsets about the cast of Christmas begins to find its tradition, I would say, when it comes to the nativity scene or, what, you know, or maybe how you've been taught about this story. Because the story, at least how I was portrayed as I was younger or I saw it, was that here's Mary and Joseph and they come in one late real night and it's cold outside and they make their way into Bethlehem and everyone's asleep and there's the, the stars are all out and it's peace and it's quiet and all of a sudden they go to a little hotel and a motel and they knock on the door and some little short, grumpy innkeeper says, How, what do you bother me for? There's no room in the inn. Don't you see the no vacancy sign? There's no rooms in the hotel and there's no rooms. In, and then Mary and Joseph are going door to door knocking and everyone's full and no one has place but all of a sudden her water breaks and she's gonna have a baby and so they find a stable and they find this stable and there's all these, you know, wild, not wild animals, all these animals there and it's stink and it's nasty and there's a manger and, and here's Joseph all by himself going, what do I do, what do I do, what do I do? And he, gives, he helps Mary give birth. I don't know how ever man helps her give birth, but he helps her give birth and they take baby Jesus, swallow him up. Oh, let's put him in a feed trough and put him in a stable. See, maybe that's the picture that you have of, of baby Jesus or some have suggested that they couldn't find a place and there was a cave and there's this cave next to Bethlehem or outside of Bethlehem and they hurry into a cave where animals may stay and they go in this dark cave and they give birth to baby Jesus and lay him in a cave. See, that's the Western mind said. And, and, and I wanna suggest to you that there could be something else different when you look at the text of how the cast of Christmas or the birth of Jesus actually has panned out. First, let's walk through this text real quick. I want you to understand Luke, who's a doctor, by the way, don't miss this, he writes more about the birth of Jesus than anybody. He's very attention to detail, very, very good student to this. He wants us to know, first of all, great Theophilus, who he's writing this letter to, he wants you to know this. This was Mary's firstborn. Now, that's very, very important because our Catholic friends believe in the perpetual virginity of Mary. They believe that Mary stayed a virgin for the rest of her life. But Dr. Luke, Dr. Luke, Dr. Luke says, wait, 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 no, that was a firstborn. Because the scripture is clear that she goes on and has more children and more kids and more babies and Jesus had half brothers and half sisters. We see this all through history. And, and so Luke wants to know, no, 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 she had more kids. Jesus was just the firstborn, which gave proof to the purity of her virginity. The second thing I want you to understand is the Bible says Jesus was born, watch this, while they were there, the time came. 
See, some think that it was immediately that night. Now, we don't know. I wasn't there. You probably wasn't there. But the way Luke writes the text, they were settled in. While they were there, then the time came. It didn't say immediately when they got there, the water break, baby Jesus came, all this stuff. It says while they were there. So the thought of them coming in and can't find the place and knocking on doors, it's in the middle of the night, really doesn't lend itself the way Dr. Luke writes this in the text. And then the, one of the big pictures here is the inn or the inn keeper. And so there are a couple of theories. Let's walk this out. One was the stable. Now, this is something very fascinating because when you see a nativity scene, right? This is the cast of Christmas. When you see the nativity scene, you always see like a barn or maybe a stable and there's some animals and the wise men and then there's the shepherds and baby Jesus, Mary Joseph and all this stuff. But in this time, for you to have a barn for your animals, you had to be very wealthy. Only wealthy people had stables. Only wealthy people had barns. We know that Mary and Joseph at all was not wealthy at all. We know that. In fact, we know that because we see the offering that she presents to the Lord after Jesus was born. They took him to the temple. He was circumcised on the eighth day. And then after her purification took place by law, she went and she offered up a sacrifice for her, for, for her firstborn son. And she gave pigeons or turtle dove, which means that's an impoverished gift. If you didn't have means, God said, if all you had was two turtle doves or a pigeon, that was enough for your offering. And that's what Mary offers up, which lets us know the wise men had not come yet because she didn't have frankincense, myrrh, and gold because she could have gave that. She didn't even have that yet. She was very, very poor. So for them to go stay in a stable or a barn, I mean, they would have had to know or been part of a wealthy family, which we see that is According to what we see with her offerings, that is not her. So I think the barn and the stable one is kind of pushed to the side. But then there's the cave. And this is the one that's probably tradition falls on the most. And the reason why is because 150 years after Jesus died, or 150 AD, Justin Martyr suggested in his writing, because everyone started talking about Jesus, the King of Jesus, and the Lord, Lord, and born in Bethlehem. So everyone's like, where was he born? Was he born? Because no one knew when he, Jesus was born, like this was going on. The shepherds knew because the angels told them. And we'll talk about that on Friday. But Justin Martyr writes, 150 AD says, I suggest that Jesus was born in this cave, and this is a specific place where he was born. Well, it got so much steam over the next 200 years that Constantine, and 335 AD assigned the cave to be the nativity. Actually, he called it the Church of Nativity. And to this day, you can Google this. Type, you can type in Church of Nativity. And to this day, it's one of the biggest tourist places in all of Israel. They built this building around it. And you can go down into the ground. There's this little cave right here where they suggest that Jesus was born in that cave. And it's called the Church of Nativity. And if you ever visit Israel, you could go exactly to that spot. Why? Because Justin Martyr in 150 AD suggested that he believes that was the place that Jesus was born. But I've got another suggestion for you. And when I look at the text and, and see how Dr. Luke wrote the text, I don't necessarily fall in the camp that there's a stable, nor do I think it's a cave. I lean that Jesus was born in a house. And let me show you why I believe that. One, Joseph was from the bloodline, the house of David. Now, it's one thing to be born in Bethlehem. It's another day, thing to say, my great, great, great granddaddy, oh yeah, it's King David. When you were born through the bloodline of King David, you were unique, not that you had special powers, but you were treated differently because you were from King David's lineage. It's the first thing. Number two, it says after they settled down and settled in, it didn't say that it leans to the point they were there and then a while the time came, which means they were already settled in waiting to be part of the census. That's how I see it in the text. But here's the big one, number three. This culture thrived itself and had the high esteem value of hospitality. In fact, hospitality is one way that you would be shamed by you and your family for not being hospitable. So I want you to imagine that here comes someone from the bloodline of King David into a city that reveres hospitality, and on top of that, your wife is pregnant for you to go, <coughs> excuse me, for you to go door to door knocking and people reject you. That would not have happened in this town of Bethlehem, especially to an heir, not an heir, but a bloodline of King David. So that one makes me think of it a little different. But really what gives it away is that the unique Greek word that Dr. Luke uses 
for the word in. There was no room in the inn. Now, he knows what a hotel is. How do I know that? Because they talk about it in the Good Samaritan. Remember the Good Samaritan came by and said, here, bandage him up, take care of them, put him in a room in your motel, your hotel, bill my account, I'll make sure he's taken care of. So he knew the Greek word for what we would think of a motel or a place to stay. He does not use that here. So what does he use for the word in? Remember Jesus when he comes into the town, he says it's time for the Passover and he sends the disciples, says go and what you'll find a guy, ask him if we can borrow his upper room that we can use the room on his house, the upper room on his house and we will celebrate the Passover there. That is the exact same Greek word that Dr. Luke uses right here, upper room. And so what he literally says, there is no space in the guest room for Mary and Joseph when they arrived or when they begin to settle in. Why not? Because everyone's coming all over the place to register for the census. And because there was such a hospital to welcome people, they let people bombard their house and fill their houses. Why? Because we revere hospitality. So if I can, I wish I had my whiteboard up here. I don't have it and don't, don't run and get it real quick if somebody heard me say that. But what I would draw for you and show you, if you can walk through this virtual like metaverse reality with me, right? We give, everybody gets a VR. You get VR headset and you get a VR headset. Never mind. And sorry, that's the coffee. And then you, you, you have the, if I could walk you through this, picture this. There's a, there's a square rectangle building and you walk into this door. And when you walked in this door, this is a place where you would put your animals. Poor people didn't have barns and stables. They had one or two animals they would put right here in this place in the house for multiple reasons. One, so no one would steal them. Two, to keep them out of the weather. But three, to keep them warm in a time that was cold. And then imagine that a platform raised up about three feet, four feet high, and on this platform were places where you would put your feeding troughs so when you're in the living room, you could put food in for the animals. Then you would walk up maybe two or three steps, and then all of a sudden, you'd have this flat room that would be your living room, your kitchen, your dining room, and where you would do life with your family and sleep. But then you'd walk through another doorway without a door on it into another small room, and that was called the upper room. Archaeologists have discovered this. Even to this day, the houses that are designed even to this day, they even use the same Greek word. Like you would go into the guest room of the upper room, you would say. So what Dr. Luke wants us to know that in the inn, in the guest room, upper room, there was no space on the floor for them to stay because everyone was there. So guess where they stayed? Where the animals stayed. The first room when you walked into the house and when Jesus was born, they wrapped him with cloths and they laid him in the feeding trough inside this home. Now, some of you are big debaters, right? And you wanna debate all this. Here's reality. He was born in Bethlehem. I don't know 100% if it's a stable or a cave, but the way Dr. Luke writes the text, I would lean and fall in the camp that he, because of the hospitality, because of the Western eyes and how we make up the story, I believe if we just say true to the text and how it's written, I believe it was in a house there was no room for them, and they laid Jesus in the manger in this. She, she, it happened when they got there, a little bit after they got there, and this culture of hospitality, the, men, the women, they would have been there to take care of a pregnant woman, and they would have laid them in the feed trough. Now, you may say, what's the big deal? Here's the big deal. He was born, okay? But since it's the cast of Christmas, we wanna get behind the scenes. You got a picture when you see the nativity scene. Is it everything that we think it's to be or have we commercialized it because it looked good when they sit on our shelf in a stable in a barn? So we just have to walk through and be true to the text as we study it. But the good news at the end of the day is that he was born. Now, remember what Gabriel said to, to Mary? In Luke chapter one, he said this. Don't be afraid, Mary, the angel told her. For you have found favor with God and you will conceive and give birth to a son and you will name him Jesus. He will be very great and will be called the son of the most high. The Lord God will give him the throne of his ancestors David and he will reign over Israel forever. His kingdom will never, ever, ever, ever end. So this is fascinating. So the angel says you're to name him Jesus, which means Yeshua, which literally in Hebrew means Joshua. There were so many people named Yeshua because there were so many Joshuas in that day. But there's something different about this Joshua. There's something different about this Yeshua. There's something different about this guy. He is going to be, watch this, great. 
Only God is great. Only God is good. Remember, Jesus said, why you call me good? Only God is good. Only God is good, right? He is who is great. He's saying he will be God. He will be the son of the most high. Now, you imagine that. There's no, no more, more higher than God. And so when she heard it, you are the, he will be the son of the most high God. She knew. She knew what's happening. And watch this. His kingdom will never, ever, ever end. Have you ever thought to yourself why God picked 2,000 years ago for Jesus to be born? Like, why not now? Why 2,000 years ago? Could have been 4,000 years ago. It could be 4,000 years from today, and we could all be waiting for the virgin birth to, to conceive and Jesus to be born in Bethlehem and everyone to be there waiting in Bethlehem right now watching and saying, when is he coming? Why 2,000 years ago? Now, we don't know. We're not in the mind of Christ. We, we don't have the mind of God. We, we have no earthly idea. But I want you to point out something very fascinating. In the time, in the background, in the story of what's taking place. You see, the prophet Isaiah, in Isaiah chapter nine, verse six, says this. This is beautiful. Watch this. For a child is born to us. That speaks of his humanity. But watch what it says next. And a son is given to us. That speaks of his deity. 100% man, 100% God. Isaiah says the government will rest on his shoulders and he will be called wonderful counselor, mighty God, everlasting father, Prince of Peace. His government, his rule, his reign, it's peace. It will never end. He will rule with fairness and justice from the throne of his ancestor, David, for all eternity. The passionate commitment of the Lord's heaven armies. I love that. The passionate commitment of all the angels, of the Lord, heaven's army, will make this happen. What are you saying? Nothing gonna stop but God. You know, in this Christmas season, for a lot of people, it's exciting and it's fun. For a lot of people, it's not. A lot of people are depressed. They're anxious. They're sad. This may be the first Christmas. There's gonna be an empty chair around the dining room table. What do you need this Christmas? What are you looking for? Because everything you need, everything you desire is found in Jesus. Wonderful counselor. How many of you right now need Jesus to do some work in your life and counsel? As you walk through depression or you walk through anxiety, you need him to be the counselor of your life. You need him to lead you and guide you and, and do a deep dive in you and work in your heart. How many of you need him to be a wonderful counselor? How many of you need a miracle in your life this Christmas season? You need God to show up. You need God to do something, maybe heal you physically. Like you need God to do something financially. Like you need something, like you need God to do something in your marriage. You need God to show up and show out something. He is mighty God. He still performs a miracle. Don't you quit. Don't you give up. He's the everlasting father. How many of you just need to be embraced with God's love this season? You don't feel loved. You're looking for love. He's the everlasting father who says, I will never, ever, ever, ever leave you nor forsake you or stop loving you. There's nothing you can do to ever separate my love from you. How many of you just need peace in your life? And I always say peace is not emotion, it's a person, his name is Jesus, who is the Prince of Peace. And listen, when Jesus is there, peace is there. And let me tell you something, Jesus is always with you. It's your awareness and perception of Jesus, not with you, that will cause you not to have peace. Because he's always with you. What do you need Jesus to do in your life this Christmas season? Well, I want you to picture something here. 
Let's go back to Caesar. Caesar Augustus takes over for his assassinated uncle. And under his rule and reign, guess what he does? He ushers in one of the greatest times of peace. Pax Romana means Rome peace. And because of the peace and the prosperity of Rome and expansion and the rule and the reign, they deified August. They deified Caesar Augustus. In fact, just throwing it out there, that's where we get the month August from. It's named after Caesar Augustus. And people begin to say, he's a god. Look at the peace that he has brought to Rome. Look at the prosperity he has brought to Rome. To the point where Caesar began to believe he was a god because the legend says that Caesar Augustus and Alexander the Great, if you do his, love your history buffs out here, that Caesar Augustus and Alexander, Alexander the Great were both miraculously conceived by a serpent. It's a crazy legend. And so the rumor in the world said, here is a God who was miraculously conceived by a serpent who has bought Pax Romana, who's brought peace to Rome. And they begin to worship him as a God. And so in Preen, a place called Preen in Western Turkey, and you can go there today, there's an inscription that was inscribed, watch this, in 9 BC by the Greeks. The Greeks were so fascinated with Caesar Augustus who's brought this peace to the world, who's brought prosperity to the world. To this day, you can go and see the etching that the Greeks wrote about Caesar Augustus, 9 BC, just a few years before Jesus was born. And you know what the inscription says? They take this hour, say a nail or something sharp, and they take this hammer and they begin to etch it in the stone. And they etched this about Caesar Augustus. And here's what they wrote, that his birth signaled the beginning of good news for the world. <laughs> this is so fascinating. That same Greek word for good news means gospel, means glad tidings, good news. The whole world thought Caesar Augustus is the one who brings good news. Glad tidings, the gospel. He was miraculously conceived by a serpent. He's brought peace to Rome and prosperity that we've never seen. And the Greeks begin to etch in. Here's the man, his birth who signal, the God who signal peace and good news to the world. Who would ever thought that just a few years later, God's like, boy, boy, you have no idea about good tidings. What did the angels say to the shepherds when they appeared to him when Jesus was born. Do not be afraid. I bring to you what? Come on, say it. What? I bring to you good news. I bring to you glad tidings. I bring to you the gospel. He has been born in Bethlehem. You will find him. We'll talk about this on Friday. Just a little, little, little commercial for it. The real good news, Rome, has just been born in Bethlehem. To the point, when you now read the gospel, listen what the gospel's writers wrote in the first century for all to hear. Mark writes this in Mark chapter one, verse one. This is the good news. This is the gospel. The good news is about Jesus the Messiah, not Caesar Augustus. You see why Mark writes that? Mark goes on and writes in Mark 1, 14, Jesus went to Galilee. He preached God's good news. He preached God's gospel. 
He preached God's glad tidings. And here's what he said. The kingdom of God is near. Repent of your sins and believe the good news. Every Roman, all the Jews knew the Greeks sketched and etched thinking Caesar Augusta was the one. And the gospel writer said, no, 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 y'all, Rome, you missed it. <laughs> it's not Caesar. It's Jesus. In fact, I love this in Matthew 24, it says, and the good news about the kingdom of God will be preached to the whole world. So all the nations will hear it and then the end of the time will come. See, what you etched in about Caesar here that he brings in good tidings for the world. No, 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 no. Jesus is the one. And this is so fascinating, the Apostle Paul. The Apostle Paul who was a citizen of Rome and he knew all this, but also a God-fearing Jew. Listen to this, cellmate. he pins a letter to the Romans. And guess what the Apostle Paul writes when he writes a letter to Rome who knows that thought that Caesar Augustus was the God of good news, of gospel that brings in peace to the world. You know what they write? You know what he wrote to Rome? Listen to what he wrote, Romans 1 verse 16. For I am not ashamed of the good news. Oh, they knew exactly when he wrote that, what he was saying. I'm not ashamed of the gospel. I'm not ashamed of the good tidings about Christ, not about Caesar, about Christ. Watch this. It is the power of God at work saving everyone who believes, whether you're a Jew or you're a Greek, whether you're a Jew or you're a Gentile, AKA, whether you're a Jew or you're a Roman citizen, Caesar is not Lord. Jesus is Lord. And so I often wonder, is that why God ushered in the good news right when the whole world thought the good news was in Caesar Augustus? And Jesus said, I'm about to flip the world upside down. I'm about to change how you even, you think Julius Caesar changed the calendar? I'm about to change time. All around a miraculous birth from a teenage virgin girl in the city of David called Bethlehem. And while the whole world was focused on prosperity and peace, little poor Mary and Joseph deliver the King of Kings, the Lord of Lord, the Son of God. And so what do you need Jesus to do for you this Christmas? He is the wonderful counselor. He's the mighty God. He's the everlasting Father. And do not miss this. And it was one of the biggest reasons he came is to dealt sin a blow and watch this bring peace for all eternity. I'm gonna ask you what about your head. amazing how the scripture just even applies to our life today. It's living and it's active. And maybe as you study and look at the nativity scene this Christmas and you drive by and you see Mary and Joseph and you remind yourself, man, how tough that would have been in society. Man, here's a God-fearing teenage girl who was full of God's word. Man, here was a man, Joseph, who could have put his wife away, but didn't because he was obedient to what God wanted to do. There's baby Jesus in the manger. Man, right when they thought the whole world through Caesar Augustus brought peace and prosperity, Jesus was born. I pray when you see the cast of Christmas, your mind would be a little different and how you portray that nativity scene because you can't stay at the manger. You gotta go to the cross. Jesus was born to die. To bring, watch this, you eternal peace. And all you have to do is repent of your sin and put your faith and trust in Jesus and you will be saved. 
And so no matter if you're at any of our campuses or watching online or right here in the house, listen, you can give your life to Jesus right now. Just say, Jesus, I believe. I believe you came for me. <laughs> I believe you died for me. And I believe three days later, you got up out of the grave for me. Now help me follow you all the days of my life. If that's you and you cried out whether you're watching online or at one of our campuses, host and your campus pastor, one of them is gonna come out just in a moment and they're gonna share with you your next steps. Father, thank you so much for your word. Thank you for how relevant it is. It's so easy to read quickly through the Christmas story and not pay attention to the cast, the plot, the setting, the background, the context, and miss what you're trying to tell us. The good news has come. And God, thank you so much for sending him. For apart from him, we can do nothing. But through him, God, we can do everything you give us the strength to do. And so, Father, this Christmas season, I pray that you would be the wonderful counselor in areas that need to be counseled, that you would be the mighty God, the miracles that need to be performed. You'll be the everlasting fathers, that you would surround your arms around us, that we would feel your love and feel your presence. And God, that you would be our peace in the midst of chaos. And we'll give you all the praise and all the glory. For it's in Jesus' name we ask and pray. Amen. Thank you all so much for joining us online today. We hope you enjoyed it. We enjoyed having you. But anyways, guys, man, we are, uh, like I said, just so glad that you were able to join us. And maybe today uh, you're curious about maybe what your next step is on your journey with Jesus. Or maybe today you took your very first step of giving your life to Jesus. And first off, I just wanna say, man, I'm so proud of you. And man, God is gonna do something amazing in and through you. But we just wanna celebrate with you. Like I said, whether you're curious what your next step may be, or maybe it was your first step in following Jesus, I wanna encourage you all to go to betterlife.church slash next steps. Let us know just so we can help you on your journey with Jesus and also celebrate with you. But also, if you would like to financially uh, support what God is doing in this region, uh, in your city, in, in your town, or just all over the world, you can go to betterlife.church slash give, and you can financially support Better Life Ministry and what God is doing here. Also, just like to say, if you have uh, if you want to stay connected with us throughout the week, you can download the Better Life Church app on any major platform. Stay connected with us. We have scripture there. We have so many things there to connect with you just throughout the week as well. But anyways, guys, thank you all so much for checking us out online today. And we cannot wait to connect with you. See you next week.